Er bestaan zoveel meer stemmen dan het normaal dat wij gewend zijn. En dus wil ik vragen om solidariteit. Bevecht alle vormen van racisme. You have to say no to racism. Want discriminatie raakt iedereen. Wij zijn mensen van vlees en bloed. Wij zijn meer dan wat jij denkt te zien. Racisme gaat ons allemaal aan. En het besef dat we het niet alleen doen, maar we doen het samen. Warm welcome everyone tonight on behalf of Pakhuis de Zwijger African Refugees Collective uh, and Comité 21 Maart for this important program uh, Right to Human Dignity for Undocumented People and Stateless People. My name is Kirsten Ploeg and I will be your host for tonight. This uh, program is part of the Week Against Racism, which is already going into its third year, uh, meaning that we have uh, anti-racist programming all week that you can follow, culminating in the national March Against Racism and Discrimination on the 21st of March, which is coming Sunday, which you are also warmly invited to join. So the goal of tonight is to be speaking uh, about the uh, situation and the human rights situation of undocumented and stateless people. Uh, and we have uh, four excellent people uh, uh, speaking with us tonight with a lot of expertise and experience on this topic. Uh, basically, the program is twofold. We will start with one panel uh, speaking about the current situation and how it evolved like this. Uh, and the second panel, we will be uh, looking more at solutions. Uh, and in between, we will also be looking at um, a recent initiative, uh, a petition uh, for uh, undocumented people. Uh, and uh, we will be speaking uh, to the founders uh, on that topic. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to start with the first panel. Uh, joining me first are uh, Mohammed Ali from uh, the founder of African Refugees Collective. Uh, on my right, we also have Hidaya Nampima from Amsterdam City Rights, another uh, uh, organization doing a lot on uh, refugee rights. Uh, and of course, we have Rian Ederveen from Stichting LOS, uh, Landelijk Ongedocumenteerde Steunpunt, or in English, uh, Nationwide Support Center for Undocumented People. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, we have this program in English tonight because it's uh, better for some of the speakers to be uh, talking uh, in English. So um, I wanted to start with uh, you, uh, Ali, and also uh, Hidaya, because uh, both of you have firsthand lived experience with uh, being undocumented uh, inside the Netherlands for many years. Uh, and maybe you can, uh, to get us started, talk, talk to us a little bit about what it means to be undocumented in the Netherlands. What kind of, how do you live? What kind of obstacles do you face? Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Actually, leads first. Very good. So I think Hidaya, she's now in really current situation. She's really practicing it. So I think she have. Uh, thank you very say. much for the beautiful introduction. Like you said, um, I'm Hidaya Nampima. I come from Uganda. I am an active member of Amsterdam City Rights. I'll give you a brief recap of Amsterdam City Rights. Amsterdam City Rights was basically formed to fight for the rights of undocumented people. And this was basically put to bridge the gap between the people with papers, to bridge the gap between uh, people who have gotten status with the undocumented people. I found it very necessary to come up and be part of Amsterdam City Rights because I feel I can have a voice for very many people out there who dare not to speak. What does it mean to be undocumented and how do you become undocumented? Uh, I'll give you my personal experience that when I arrived in the Netherlands, I went to seek for asylum. When I sought for asylum, uh, I indeed did not believe my story and therefore I was kicked out of the camp. So I've, having been kicked out of the camp, I had to look for my way of survival simply because I could not go back to my country. It's very tough to be undocumented. It's very challenging in a way that there's so many things that you cannot really enjoy. For instance, the right to education. Before I left the camp, I was really yearning to learn Dutch. I was really learning to have a full integration with 
the Dutch community. But uh, my contact person told me simply because I have not been granted my status, I cannot be given uh, a class to uh, a chance to go and learn Dutch, which was a very big disappointment because I have spent three years literally now, but I still cannot speak Dutch. So the right to education is still a challenge. The right to health care. I know for a fact uh, a few friends who have gone through a catastrophe to access medical health. You go through so many channels. There's a friend of mine who had to wait for six months before his tooth could be attended to. This is really so challenging. I also talk about the right to expression and freedom of speech. I know for a fact that very, very many of my friends cannot really come out and speak about the oppression or the bully or the kind of resistance they find in society simply because they feel they'll be deported. So that is also still a challenge. I also talk about the inadequacy to accommodation and housing. Being an activist, being a very active member, so many people find it easier to contact me about some problems. On a daily basis, I get two or three phone calls from people who are looking for shelter. And to be honest, some people call you and they will say, hey, I'm looking for a shelter. I was told you are a manager of a shelter. Well, I may not really look undocumented, but I am. But it's very depressing that mothers and children are put on the street. I don't really know where that really comes from because I think the mothers should always be given priority. But the fact that they are pushed on the streets with, without given a chance to have uh, a place where they can call home, that is still also a challenge. Also, being undocumented means you basically don't have a right to have a bank account. For three years, I don't have a, a BSN number. I cannot have a bank account because of the policies. So there's really so much that we are battling with. The right to have a sustainable income. Like I would give you an example about myself. I live in Maya Angelou shelter. It's a very organized shelter, basically for all women. We feel very safe. But I find it very dissatisfying that we have to depend on the government for the 50 year that we are given weekly. We are not dumb people. We are very active people. We are very vibrant people. We can always exercise our rights. How do you want us to exercise our rights if you don't give us a chance to integrate with you? How do we need to have integration? If we are given a chance to work, that means we are going to uh, contribute to the economic base of the society or, or Netherlands. And also, um, we feel that so many policies, so many r laws that are being put in place to govern uh, the undocumented people. I think it's really very wrong that uh, they are making policies about us and without us. So I think we should always be considered or we should always be given a platform to really talk about the things that we are experiencing or the things that we feel are not really going right. And this can only be done if we are always called upon or if we are told to choose representatives who will talk on our behalf. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Hidaya, for okay. giving uh, that overview of, of what you are facing and what your friends are facing. Um, Ali, I'm also looking to you because you've also lived for many years as an uh, undocumented person in the Netherlands. Um, you were, you're looking at me. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but do you, do you recognize this picture that Hidaya is painting? Yeah, uh, well, let me introduce myself. Oh, my that's it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me. My name is Kamayogi Mohamed Ali, and I come from Democratic Republic of Congo. Most I like to say that 
is a part of racism. This is a week against racism because Africa never shaped those 58 terrain you see there. They were shaped in convention called Congo Conference. It was in 1884 in right, Berlin. The national boundaries were made by colonial powers. So then uh, the we had those... In 1880. Exactly. Yeah. So for me, I feel like we are Africans and we don't belong to those nations. Because we Africans, we never choose to be that. Someone else has due colonial system has shaped those terrain. So I feel real, I'm just African. And today, if <clears throat> one of diaspora person would return to Africa and say, I'm an African and I'm coming back home, where would they address this person? In Ghana, in Congo, in Nigeria? So Africa is supposed to be just Africa. You can live through governing just with federal states. It's very simple, very easy. Same thing with the countries, but we put the borders so we can be, you can solve catastrophe we see. So now people end up here through same issues. And now when you come back here to the undocumented matters, I never been actually undocumented. I came to the Netherlands with through United Nations and IND. Every year, Netherlands invite 500 families. So that's how I end up here. But I lived seven years on the street and I have been with, since 2011 with the movement called We Are Here when Somali occupied the Terapo. And there were a couple of solutions and small group end up in Osdorp. And the mov movement was so really showing that the basic rights are being all violated because the undocumented, it's, you've been, how, there's no word to describe this life. Because is that right that all of us, we are equal? Are we really truly all of us equal? When there is a person who need to live with the 50 euros a week, the budget I made it since I came in this country, I'm nearly 13 years in this country. So 50 euros, when kilogram of rice, since I came here, it was eight, couple of eight cents. Now it's moving to nearly two euros. So why there is no any thought on this kind of really human being, if we all of us were human and equal? Think about that you're living the 50 euro a week. You need to get your groceries, you need transportation. And government doesn't think to all this, what they maintain is just implement laws which one has no lobby on really field because we're on this field and we're experiencing that undocumented are being mistreated and oppressed with policies. Look end of this year of 2020, what happened during the winter when the government was giving here in Amsterdam a shelter for three days, for two weeks. And at the end of the day, the minister, he will tweet how many days the shelter will be open. So the thought on undocumented, it start to come when it's becoming in minus. That's when we think about undocumented. Very soon they are going to close the night shelters. People are coming on the street where they are going, where they're heading. They don't want to give people sophie numbers. They don't want to give people right to work so they can be able to sustain themselves. But this is all 25 political of declaration of human rights. So always the national laws, they just strip away the declaration of human rights and undocumented people, they are living. There's no police applying on these people. How would you let a person working in the street of Amsterdam? without having a place to sleep, without providing a food. And at the end of the day, this person needs to find his own way. Would you blame a person that has committed a crime? But when we take a look at criminals, there is no among us undocumented. When we take a, look, take a look at the justice record, undocumented people are not criminals. They're just very vulnerable. 
a way that you wonder how your day will be every day, every single day. So it means it's kind of appetite. Let me call it appetite. There's people who need to have that life. Yeah. And other people need to have that life. Yeah. And that's we and they. So when I'm hoping this new government is going to really come up with different policies because this is beyond way of oppressing human being. Yeah. Because when you take a Dutch constitution and then when you take a look what institution are applying here to the grassroots is quite confusing. People are supposed to have those rights. We need to have the basic right. Yeah. And that basic right they are not really practiced. So whom shall we blame? Yeah. So we're living in one of the richest countries in the world and there are people who live on not even close to the national poverty line and way way, way below. No basic rights, as Hidaya also explained, uh, to work, education, people living on the streets. Um, what surprises people sometimes is that these laws have not always been the case. Uh, Rian, you have been active on uh, undocumented uh, people for decades already, and you have seen policies change. Can you tell us a little bit about how that evolved over the last few decades? Yeah, I think um, I... I work for rejected asylum seekers since the beginning of the 90s. Um, so um, at that time, in fact, asylum seekers were not put, pushed on the streets as they are now. So when they were rejected, they could still stay in the asylum shelters. Um, and it was also not all of them were camps. There were also lots of them were simple houses in just rented houses where few people lived, like um, now um, students, for instance, share um, a house together. So when people, well, when asylum seekers got a negative decision, they could be expelled, of course, if that would be possible, deport deported, but most of them couldn't be deported. So they stayed in these shelters or homes where they lived. And um, that changed the end of the 90s. Um, then new laws came into force with um, Minister Cohen then, um, who decided that when asylum seekers are rejected, then they have to leave these shelters or these camps. And gradually this evolved into the uh, Aliens Law of 2001, where it was in the law that a rejected asylum seeker should leave the camp within four weeks. So that's for the rejected asylum seekers. But there are also, of course, lots of um, labor migrants who are undocumented. And in the beginning of the 90s, that was, in fact, the majority. So there were many people who came uh, Moroccans, Turkish people, also uh, Suriname people, of course, and people who were, in fact, refugees from Southern America, um, but who came as a labor migrant, um, undocumented, but they could register in the municipality, get a SOFI number, BSN number, <laughs> and work and pay taxes. Um, so there were really many of them. Uh, this, this was the majority of undocumented migrants, in fact. And they were also really active. They uh, did manifestations and the hunger strikes and uh, church occupations and things like that. Um, and so they were really also very visible and got a lot of media attention and a lot of success also. That was mainly the labor migrants. And in the 90s, this, this shifted. In fact, the Commissie Zeevalking in, two, in 1991 published a report that we have to clear this, this whole unclear system with people undocumented working and refugees, uh, rejected refugees staying in these asylum camps and so on. We have to make that more um, um, logic. So people who are rejected have to leave. People who are undocumented shouldn't use our collective services, shouldn't be able to work and so on. So he published a report in 1991 
And as an effect of this report, the coupling threat, the linkage law, came into force in 1998. And this linkage law connected, in fact, the, um, the right to services with the right to um, residence permits. So people without the residence permit couldn't use any public services yeah. or couldn't work legally or couldn't pay taxes anymore, couldn't um, get the health care insurance, for instance, couldn't get a bank account. All these things that were possible before the 90s for all these irregular labor migrants who were in the Netherlands, that was no more possible. So, in fact, during the 90s, this changed. Yeah. Um, and I think I still come across people who, who came to the Netherlands before the 90s and still have their BSN number, and some of them continue to work um, because they had all these connections. A colleague of mine who was more active in the labor migrant uh, organizations, in the irregular labor migrant organizations, she did a research, Marijke Bell, she did a research on um, the power of irregular migrants. And she found out that at the time that people were still working legally, they also had bargaining power and they could um, join the union, for instance. And so they, they still can join the union, but then they were also included in the CAO, for instance, and all the bargaining um, activities of the union as, as legal workers. So they could, make, they could profit also from the results of their actions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking since the 90s, something else also changed in the Netherlands, which is the rise of the far right, basically. Uh, it was Cohen, actually, you mentioned, which is the so-called left labor party uh, that did all of this. But we do see kind of the, the shift towards racism and xenophobia in the Netherlands. Do so you think that played a role in all these changes in these laws? Um. I think it's it's a bit difficult to say that, in fact. I think in the 90s, this was... The beginning of the 90s, this didn't play a role, I think. It was more that there were people... I, I, I uh, tried to find, to, to look back at this uh, 1991 report, and um, the arguments then were they make use of our collective services, so they, they could also get um, bystand, for instance, so um, get public support. Yeah. yeah, public welfare. Um, because they paid taxes, they could also get a like, pension or they could also get um, um, unemployment benefits and things like that. Um, and, and they wanted to to make it clear that undocumented people don't have the right to work and they don't have a right to our collective services. That was more the argument then. Right. Although I do hear that argument now as well uh, a lot. Um, saying uh, just yesterday, Wilders is on TV saying how many hundreds of billions of dollars, which is totally fictitious numbers, but yeah. it, it is familiar. Yeah. Um, but I, I, we'll get back to this later because I want to uh, move on to the uh, petition. Um, because uh, we have here uh, also Mohammed uh, Alka Duhimi, uh, who together with Ali as well, Mohammed Ali uh, founded uh, a new petition, which you can uh, see uh, behind me on the screen. Uh, Petitie Recht op Menswaardig Bestaan, which is uh, more or less also the title of this event. So, uh, Right to Human Dignity. Um, so, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, why you started the petition, what's in there, why it is important. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, thank you, uh, of course, for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk about this presentation here. Uh, let's uh, first start by uh, saying who are the initiators, uh, because uh, uh, Mohammed Ali is uh, one of the initiators. Uh, he's here on the table and uh, Basima Spikerman also. Uh, she worked on uh, this uh, petition. Uh, and me myself uh, did that too. So uh, it's good to to, to uh, also uh, name uh, Basima. 
because uh, she 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 is experienced on uh, the matter of statelessness. Uh, the petition is uh, actually has started because of uh, one certain thing. Our system exclu excludes some people, and we have heard it just now. Uh, uh, Ria or Rian? Ria. Uh, she she told us about how this system evolved into this system we have now, and. Let's go, I think I always think let's go back to the basic. In the basis, we all people are equal and all people have the right on a digni uh, dig their, their human dignity. So that is the basis. And I think every, every person, when I talk to my nieces, they're quite young, I tell them there are people sleeping on the streets. Uh, they would say, oh, wow, really? How can that happen? And what does the government do? So that's, those are the first questions people ask. So in the basis, uh, every person has the right on human dignity. And this is also the, the uh, vertrekpunt, we say in the, in the, in the Netherlands, the, uh, the point we start from. Uh, we are seeing a system which fails. Uh, we have a very strong uh, social system in the Netherlands. And those people... Uh, undocumented and uh, we call them illegalen uh, get get labels uh, so we can exclude them out of the system so what we do say with this petition let's start over let's look at the things uh, which do don't work well in our system and let's just fix them don't talk too much just fix them so we start first with a uh, shelter for everybody uh, that is the first point in the petition for uh, the second uh, point is m medical uh, care for everyone, which is on paper very, very well organized, but in practice, it's a very, very dif difficult subject to talk about. And I think uh, the people on the table can, can uh, confirm that. Uh, the third point is uh, the right to participate in the society. This is a very important thing because uh, some of the people I speak to, which are on the streets, are like there for 10 years. We are making those people, we are disabling those people to use their human existence to, uh, yeah, to, 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 uh, bijdragen, to, to, to put some effort to help the society. So we, we are excluding them. We are actually taking away their basic rights to uh, take care of themselves. I mean, yes, shelter is very important for those people who can take of the care of their, themselves. But there are people who can and they want. Uh, yeah, so why do we have a system that disables those people from taking care of themselves? This is actually, I cannot uh, use a lot of words uh, to describe this. It's just stupid. It's just a stupid system. <laughs> so that is uh, one of the things. Um, yeah, some, some uh, Fremdelingen, so we, we call them Fremdelingen, like strangers, aliens, uh, we are put into detention without any reason. They're uh, picked up from the streets and they're put into detention. We want to restrict that. Actually, we want to make that only possible in very, very specific cases where there is danger. It shouldn't be uh, automatically accepted that we uh, put people into detention without them doing anything wrong. Uh, we have also a point, dwangsom en beroep bij niet tijdig beslissen. This is a new law which has been uh, brought in by the parliament, uh, because normally when you, you, you have an asylum uh, process, you start a asylum request, you uh, have to get answer within a certain amount of time. So when that doesn't happen, the state, the Netherlands, should pay you back uh, an amount like uh, because, because they didn't uh, fulfill your rights. Okay? So what happened in the corona crisis, uh, the IND couldn't manage to answer all those asylum requests in time. So what did the government do? Okay, well, we, <laughs> well what do we do? We don't pay them. We make a law which allows us, which gives us the right to not pay these bills. So it's very easy. Uh, this, is, this, this is very typical and this shows how we in the Netherlands, uh, 
ja, doe, uh, yeah, uh, take, take, take this task seriously. The rights of these people. How serious do we take the rights of these people? Uh, we don't, actually, if we do things like this. Uh, the next point is uh, a qualitative uh, guidance for the asylum process, which is uh, also important. Uh, the legalization, legalization of people who are rooted here in the Netherlands, like I've seen people here uh, processing for 10 years, and they keep processing, and then later on they're, they're here for 20 years. Uh, guys, let's just legalize them, because <laughs> it, it will keep going, and they get uh, more rooted here in the Netherlands, and the, in, the, in the end we will have to legalize them after having them on the streets for 20 years. So in such cases, uh, legalization is maybe the best solution. Uh, also for people uh, with children, for children, cases like uh, Lili Hovik, it's very important to uh, ha look at it from a human perspective. Uh, those, those cases are very special. It's very important to uh, that that our our society we as a society take care of the children born here so this is also i think uh, legalize them uh, make sure they they get the right to uh, get education they get the right to uh, the 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 social system and everything about it and at the last the last point and this is a very crucial one because this is actually uh, against the uh, uh, G Geneve, uh, the uh, declaration. The conventions. The Geneve conventions. Yes. Uh, sometimes we uh, deport people to unsafe situation, to unsafe countries, and and this happens way too much uh, here in the Netherlands. Uh, like we have uh, a lot of cases where it happened. We uh, did with uh, Al Shweig. Uh, we deported him to Bahrain, and then when when he came there, uh, he 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 got arrested, and and and. Uh, actually, we don't really know what happened to him uh, at the moment. So uh, these are cases, uh, and and there are some other cases I can I can mention, but uh, you can look them up. So it's very important to stop doing that to uh, really ensure that the people who can come from uh, unsafe countries that they don't get put back to these unsafe countries. We don't believe people sometimes. Well, they are just telling the truth, and this is a big problem. And uh, I think we should have a system where we don't have uh, uh, false, false neg negatives. And we never would send back anyone to an unsafe country because we have a false negative. So this is very important. Uh, those points uh, we have tried to put in the uh, petition a lot of cases about statelessness, uh, how, how people... Uh, which problems people get when they are stateless or they are seen as stateless actually, uh, when they are seen as undocumented, when they are seen as illegal. So we have tried to put those uh, cases for every of these groups and to, to try to find solutions for them. Well, I'm not saying this is the perfect petition for every use case, but I think it's a start. We can start with it and we can uh, make a movement around it. This is very important because what we see at the moment is uh, the undocumented people, the asylum seekers, the uh, stateless people are just uh, an agenda on the political, uh, the, the, the parliament, which is not the most loved agenda because actually uh, they, 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 they don't have a voice. They don't have the right to, to vote, so they cannot uh, strafen, punish, punish the political parties who do them bad. So this is very important that uh, we as a society, all of us, make a fist and say this can't be happened. We need a social system. We need to take care of everybody, every human here on the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I think... That is what the petition is for. That is the uh, intention of the petition. And I think it's also very important uh, to, to tell also the people who are interested in joining forces, guys, let's keep in touch. Let's, um, if it's possible, contact us. Let's see what we can do together so we can make a big lobby group. 
we can make a movement to uh, change things, actually, and not only uh, talk about things. Uh, so, so, so really to put it on the political agenda. Right. So you're, f you're finishing as well with a call to action, basically. Uh, and anyone watching uh, to help you out, to, to fill in more points. Um, also for the people watching, uh, you mentioned stateless and undocumented people a few times. I've been doing the same. So just for the people at home, um, basically the difference is undocumented people don't have a residency permit to stay here. Uh, if you're stateless, it also means that there is no state actually uh, where you are considered a citizen. So you, you cannot really go anywhere. Um, so those those are you know uh, extra issues. You can be both undocumented and stateless, of course, as well. Uh, so you're addressing all the different groups. Um, uh, are there, for example, can you maybe um, tell us a bit about the difference between issues facing maybe uh, stateless people and undocumented people? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, like uh, stateless people, uh, well, stateless people. I don't I don't like to put labels on people. Sure. So that 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 does touch me when I say such things, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we can we cannot uh, call them something else inside the system when we're talking in terms of system. So uh, stateless people, uh, those are people sometimes who cannot prove they are stateless. So this is the most uh, bad thing what can happen to a person. Like he is stateless, he knows he's right, but he cannot show the right papers to prove the government that he is stateless. So, and in the Netherlands, um, we don't have a fast-telling procedure for statelessness. So, we don't have uh, a way to, to like, uh, confirm that you are stateless. So, this is, this is very, very difficult, and this uh, well-defined process should come for, for the stateless people. Uh, the undocumented people are, like... Uh, also in different groups. I think the, the, the people who are here on the table can, can um, tell more about it because they, they have experienced it firsthand. Uh, but uh, one, one of the groups, like, uh, we, we have uh, Dub Dublin Clemens. Those, those are people who um, have, have uh, tried an asylum process in a different country. And they come here. They don't have uh, the, the, the uh, documents. They are not documented here. And they, they have to wait one and a half year until they can apply to an asylum process here. So what we see most of the time is that these people try to get under below the radar until they are allowed to take part in, into any uh, asylum uh, request. Yeah, so, so this, is, uh, this, is, this is one uh, a very, very particular thing. I have seen people sleeping like in a park. And when you go there, you try to find uh, a solution for them, there they just isn't. Because also, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, the possibilities here in the, in, in the Netherlands, there's only Amsterdam, which has a place for Dublin Clemens. And, uh, the, Can you explain for the people at home, the Dublin Clemens? Yeah, so, so if, you, if, you, if you have uh, applied in, a, in a, uh, other, other city or uh, other country than in the Netherlands, which uh, is an European country, I think, uh, if you have applied for asylum there and you come here to the Netherlands, you try to uh, apply for an asylum, there is a declaration between uh, different European cities that the refugees should be uh, divided under the cities, on, on, under the countries. So uh, a part goes to Italy, a part goes to the Netherlands and so on. So when you come... In, into a country, they, they put you in the system and I think they, they uh, assign you to a country. Right. Yeah. So when you go to another country and try to apply for asylum, you cannot. You have to wait one and a half year until you are able to uh, apply. Yeah, so yeah. there's also a limited choice in where you actually want to go. Maybe a family, for example, in the Netherlands, or, but you're assigned to France, for example. Then, yes. Um, yeah. yes, it happens a lot. Uh, so, so, so that's uh, problematic, and people end up here, um, and 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 they cannot go anywhere. They have to uh, wait one and a half year until they get get a place. Uh, like, uh, I'm sorry, to, until they can uh, enroll into the asylum process. Uh, so, what happens? There are a lot of people waiting. 
I've called uh, like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I called uh, different places in Amsterdam uh, where they have this uh, uh, shelter for the Blink Lemons. There, so there is a queue of 150 people waiting to, to get shelter. And those are all the Blink Lemons. So that means 150 people uh, multiplied by one and a half year, it's, it's not correct mathematics, I know, but you, it's, it gives us like, uh, yeah, an indication of how long they can, they have to wait until they get shelter. So, uh, uh, yeah, you, so you have to wait a long, long, long time before you can get shelter. And in practice, the one and a half year passes by before you can get the place. So before we move on to the solutions, I have a, a different question uh, to Hidaya and Ali, because <laughs> I notice you're both wearing a, a red cap mm. uh, and uh, it's part of a movement, I know, but I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, maybe Hidaya, you want to tell a little bit about, about why you both are wearing it. Uh, well, uh, this is called the red beret. Um, as you know, Uganda has had elections on uh, 14th January 2021 which my principal, His Excellency, I call him my president because he really won, uh, Robert Chagulani Sentamo. He won the elections, but simply because we have been ruled by a dictator for 36 years, as I recall, and he adamantly refused to hand over power to the new president-elect. So the red bullet is a symbol of standing with all our people back home in solidarity of what's happening back home. Because at the moment, uh, many of our brothers are in prison. Many are have been killed. Many, we cannot really account whether they're still alive or not. So it's really a challenging time. Like we sit here and see so many atrocities being committed on our people back home. So we cannot just fold our hands with what is happening back home. Like on Saturday, we had a demonstration. And with this demonstration, we really wanted to talk to the people in Netherlands and the organizations that are really funding the dictator. We do not really enjoy to live in bad situations and we do not really enjoy to see our people suffering. If only people want help, they can go to individual groups but not sending money to the police and the president himself to make our people suffer. So the Red Beret is really a symbol of solidarity with people back home. Yeah, thank you. That's very clear. Uh, and Yuvali Museveni, who is now ruling Uganda, um, right. also in large part got his uh, weapons from, from Western countries. Right. Um, you, uh, Ali, are um, uh, fled the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was also invaded by the same dictator. Um, do you think also the West has... Uh, uh, you already mentioned the Berlin Conference in 1880, but I mean, there's also much more recent examples of why they have a certain responsibility towards refugees. <coughs> Uh, do you think we should also take account of that? Yeah. <clears throat> well, Chris, it's um, wearing ballet for me. It's it's like legacy. It's a, it's part of being revolutionary, and this ballet they has a mean, and therefore cause. And it's not about Bobby Wine. It's about Ugandans. It's about Grand Lake region of East Africa. Museveni is a guy who been there for 36 years, really destroying that area. Honestly, when American they fell in Somalia, he took. He really said he gonna fight the terrorism in Somalia. Wow, Rwanda he just helped the rebel to get in the country. And at the same time, the genocide started. At the end of the war, when Kagame get in power, just he strike in Congo. The first hit, nearly six million of people were just gone. Uganda troops, when they enter in Turi, three million population of Turi were gone, were just cleaned up. 
So you can't imagine that M7 is the problem of the Grand Lake region of East Africa. Yeah. That's, this is the problem. Yeah. He's, he's, he's just invading the countries while he's serving the West, nothing else. Because the Netherlands today is a record, is 800,000 money. The embassy of the Netherlands is funding to the local police in Uganda. Have you saw how the sort of the pepper spray Netherlands has given to Uganda? When they spray on people, even the wounds can't be able to hear. So Netherlands is taking a part in everything happening in Uganda today. Yeah. And what we call the foreign policies of Netherlands, they are telling you that Uganda is pretty safe. So take a look how many undocumented of Ugandan who are struggling here. The government of the Netherlands is founding and the government, which one is calling it safe, which one is committing murder. Wow. You can't imagine what M7 is doing. Um, my dream is to see M7 walking away and end up behind the ball, be behind, behind the balls. That's, that's only what I'm hoping. Yeah. Joining Chastela. And this is all the fault of waste. How would you walking the long term run with a government which one's dictator and at the end of the day you call yourself that wow we are so democratic and everything is goes through corruption because nothing else has made him seven stay that longer it's only just corruption because he buy everybody if you take a look how this is the first opposition being in uganda it's just only bobby one so that's why i card this beret and then i hope if this young man would step there if him seven step down, Kagame is gone. Cross side the leave and we saw he's gone. North up, Paul yeah. is the cross west or southern west. Paul Bia will be gone. So we need just a little light because it, it's we need to end imperialism. We need to end this really modern colonization, which one is still happening today. Because yeah. West is founding the dictators, and dictators are pushing the the inhabitant out of the, their own land. And they've been mistreated by Western. This is not fair. This is a history, which one repeating history. This is generation to generation. When West is going to take a step to founding dictators, then Chris, I promise you never see me wearing a yeah. You never question me that. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think the same point can be made about the Middle East. I mean, were there any refugees from the Middle East before Sykes Speaker? Did we have any refugees? Uh, Sykes Speaker for the people at home were the colonial borders that were drawn yes. many years ago. So, so England and France have uh, divided the Middle East on a, a map and they have written uh, or uh, drawn borders. This is for France, this is the mandate territory for England, for Britain. So. Uh, since that moment, the refugee stream started. Did we know anything uh, called Palestinian refugees? That didn't exist at that time, because they had a safe country. Iraqi refugees, those weren't there. It was safe. Yeah. So what we can say is, it's not only for Africa, but also for the Middle East, that the Western uh, aggression actually uh, started this uh, 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 refugee streams. So let's get back to reality and realize that in the end, maybe at this moment, uh, uh, I'm not responsible for these refugees, um, for, for this refugee stream. My grandparents may be aware, but it's important to realize that the implication of the actions of the people here who paid taxes, so that could happen, that those resulted in the refugee stream coming. So we do have a, a, a certain plight to do something about those refugees and to help them 
and to, to give them shelter. So it's not something we have uh, nothing to do about. We have no hand in as a Western world. It's not about charity. It's about taking responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Middle East. Uh, I, I was uh, before I came here. I was looking up uh, Brown University uh, Cost of War project where they track basically the the human impact of the war on terror, and they calculated that just from four countries along the Middle East, 21 million refugees. So that's Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Um, so that's those are huge, huge numbers. Uh, the West has been more or less implicated uh, in various degrees in all of them. Um, so it's it's a very valid uh, point that you're making. Um, so I also want to uh, head towards solutions before we uh, finish the program. So uh, I want to start with you, Hidaya. Maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about what you think are the uh, most urgent steps that we need to take and that uh, maybe also people at home uh, can do to stand in solidarity with uh, undocumented and stateless people in the Netherlands. Uh, well, to begin with, I think calling people stateless is racist. I feel it's very bad. I feel it's a way of making people who are stateless inferior. They did not choose for their provinces or for their countries to be deleted from the map. Or they did not choose to live without papers to really identify them from where they come from. For example, my friend, I will not mention the name, I'll call him Mr. X. He comes from Somalia, but because he doesn't have Somalian features, so IND adamantly declined his status, not just to look into his case, why he fled, but they say simply because he doesn't look like Somalian people, so he's not Somalian. So I think calling people stateless is really racist. I'm very glad um, my brother has a petition about... Uh, uh, the stateless people. I think we should not only stop at signing the petition. What do we need to do? We need to have a committee. We need to have people who are really committed to look into individual cases of people, not just signing a petition and then you walk away because so many petitions have been signed, but they never re yield results. But if we get people who are really committed to stand for those who have been categorized, I really feel bad even to say the word stateless. It bothers mm. my heart. In my shelter, I lived uh, in Walburg in 2019. We had two ladies. They were from Tibet, but they were not believed <clears throat> that they come from Tibet. And afterwards, they, were, they lost their beds because we do not have rooms in the shelters, but we basically have a bed. So they lost their beds and they were on the streets. What happened is they had to move elsewhere. The few communications that I, I get right now is France was able to give them status. So why doesn't Netherlands really act? Why are they putting people in a jeopardy situation? I think it's ridiculous. I think they should really not just categorize people. They should look into the details of a person because nobody leaves home unless home is in danger. Nobody leaves home unless there's really a serious problem. We don't really enjoy this kind of life of being undocumented, uh, begging from here to there because trust me with the 50 euro, it's not enough. We continue to solicit for help, whatever place we get. So the solution should be, there should be a uh, committed people or committed organizations that are really working to help. For instance, I think um, Am uh, Amnesty International is really dull. I think it's not really acting. We do not need just lamentations. We need actions. We really need to see things moving. The UNHCR, what is it doing for people like... Um, I know for a fact that if a Syrian lady gives birth and let's say the mother, the, the father is dead, there's no way uh, this past, the mother can claim for the status of the child. This is ridiculous. We really need to act. I think the organizations that are really there should really step up. 
they should really step up. And also, the people who really feel can raise a voice and those people who really think can make change should come on board. I think everybody is welcome to have a voice. Like most of us do not really get a chance to talk about these issues. But when you do get a chance, please talk about it. And as people are going in for elections in the coming, I think it's... uh, Tomorrow, tomorrow, right? You can you could already vote today even. But yeah, go on. Exactly. Like people who are going in for votes, I'm very mad that we cannot vote. But if we really had a chance to vote, we would make the right choices. So people who are voting tomorrow, you should vote in relation to undocumented people. If you vote for policies that are not going to help undocumented people, we are going to be a problem. So think about us as you go to cast your vote. Think about all the problems that we have talked about and think about the integration of undocumented people because we are not criminals, we are not bad people, we are just here because we are in danger. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, so basically, you know, stay active, do, do more NGOs, also take action. Don't just write reports right. um, and, uh, and think about it when you vote tomorrow. Um, uh, well, Ali, do you have something to add? Yeah, well, when it comes to the term of the solution, the first thing I think is that the policy toward undocumented have to be changed. Really, we need the radical change on policies toward undocumented. This is unbelievable in country like Netherlands, finding people sleeping on the street, it's, it's no fair. And there's something earlier you has mentioned about the Dublin. When you take a look that they will say, okay, wow, if you have five years, you are enjoying your international protection. And when you have like a three years, two years, one year, you can wait maybe 18 months for your own. How? How is that possible? This person has no right to work, has no right to rent of anything. So the first of all, we need to go to the basic human right. Yeah. That's the first thing need to be changed regarding to undocumented. People need to have bed, need to have that basic. And from there, people need to start to think that this human are like other human, they can need at least thinking in terms of giving them just chance to have right to work. Now, I'm, I've been working on a certain case of people who live here 20 and 35 years. People who've been working self-standard, so they, yeah, self-standard. People who've been living for their own for longer than 20 years. But due to this corona pandemic, they get stuck. And these people, they seemingly that they've been what they call ombokend in the binding. So, oh, no. then the, really the many solution, I think, I'm telling everyone who's going to vote, please, please, please start to thinking really positively and understanding that we have really matter need to be solved by this. You vote tomorrow. So make right choice and do not vote against human. Try to vote protect, pro protecting human because this world is connected. Right. So vote for the people who cannot vote. I, I will move on because we are, we're almost out right, of time. Right. So Thanks, young, Chris. Uh, just uh, very short. Uh, very short. <laughs> we made a website, kiesvoorongedocumenteerde.nl, so where you can find all the points that were mentioned here um, with the different parties, how they um, presented themselves, what kind of actions they want to take on the subject of shelter for everybody, on the subject of uh, legalization, on the subject of discretionaire bevoegdheid, which is really important for us, so that there is a way to uh, make an exception for people who are in exceptional circumstances undocumented and also to stop um, aliens detention and to stop criminalization of uh, irregular migrants. So you can see all the different positions w of the different parties. Were there a few parties. parties that you can already say that came out, <laughs> that came out well? Well, <laughs> you have to look in the, in okay. the website there. I don't make... Um, uh, promotion for some well there is a barometer we made a barometer and on the on the most positive side for undocumented migrants is Bayen and then there is GroenLinks and then D66 and ChristenUnie um, and then um, I think Denk, Denk um, 
ja, zo. Voor de more details that people can look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Partij voor de dieren. Um, so yeah, um, we ask them also to uh, sign our petition um, for the return of the discretionaire bevoegdheid. So our most important points you can Great. find here. Thank Kies you. Kies voor ongedocumenteerde.nl. Any last words? Yes, um, I think it's important to think about undocumented people, asylum seekers, uh, stateless people, all those labels as humans in the basis. That is very important and we don't see that. When I tell people I have seen people sleeping in the park, undocumented, they tell me, oh, how bad. Good that you are there for them. And the next day they forgot the story. So we have to keep telling these stories. We have to give these people's, uh, people a face. Uh, at the Black Lives Matter event, it was held in a park where undocumented were sleeping in tents. There was a really small remark about those people and the rest of the evening was about racism in general. So when we're talking about racism, include these people. Don't make, uh, di don't, don't do discrimination when talking about anti-racism, anti-racism campaigns. So please include them in anti-racism campaign uh, all organizations which are for inclusiveness, diver diversity, uh, political parties who have that as points, please include this group because this is an important group. This is a group we have to take care of because we have excluded them from their rights to vote. So we have to do that for them. And also tomorrow, guys, please vote on a party which cares for people. Great. On those final words, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight uh, and uh, enlightening us about this topic. I want to thank the uh, viewers as well uh, for joining us uh, on behalf of Pakhuis de Zwijger, Comité 21 Maart and African Refugees Collective. Um, please check the program of the Week Against Racism. You can find many more uh, anti-racist uh, programs uh, on the website. And of course, join us uh, on Sunday the 21st for the national demonstration. Um, and uh, we will also like to thank our media partners Salto, Nieuwe Wij and AT5 and the support of the Gemeente Amsterdam uh, for making these programs possible. Uh, so a last shout out to petitie menswaardig bestaan.nl uh, please sign it and on that note uh, I want to uh, wish you a very good night. Thank you.